Hello and welcome to WYTV7. I am Byron Pettit, the host of Family Matters. Family Matters airs every Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I hope you will tune into weekly to support my show. Family Matters discusses real issues and challenges that individuals and families are going through in real time. The mission of WYTV7 is to educate, empower, and encourage. My hope is that weekly when you tune in, that you will be called to action after watching each one of these shows. So today we are having part two of a topic that we discussed was called dealing with the grief of the death of a child. We're fortunate to have Pastor Rua Foster back. Um, Rua Foster is a survivor of gun violence. Mr. Foster, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Mr. Foster, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you were impacted by gun violence. You know, um, I wanted to first start out by uh, sharing a little thing about today. Today is a very significant day for me, and it just shows me just how much God is powerful, how much God loves us, and how much God is alive. Today marks the fourth anniversary of the passing of my father-in-law, who went home to be with the Lord, Dr. Warren uh, L. Bennett. And um, today also marks the third anniversary of my, my birth father, um, Robert Foster. He transitioned on this day also um, three years ago. They both transitioned on the same day, um, a year apart. Um, they both had a great love and friendship for one another. Um, when we went to the hospital as my dad was transitioning, they told us that Dr. Bennett had come to care for him. No one on staff knew of a Dr. Bennett, um, but Dr. Bennett was the last doctor that cared for my dad um, as he transitioned. So we know that we are spirits and, and, and we worship God who is the ultimate spirit. And uh, I just really wanted to share the significance of that because family matters. Yeah, thank you for that. I knew Dr. Bennett, but I had a, a close relationship with your father, Mr. Foster. So, wow, what a, what a significance. God, God does not do anything by mistake. This is by design that we are able to be together again Absolutely. and for the anniversary of two significant men in your life. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I, it occurred to me this morning, like, I, I, wow, this is the 27th. This is the day. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. So you yeah. want me, go ahead. Yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you were impacted for gun violence. As we know, this is part two. So some of those who may not have seen part one, I encourage you to go back and listen to the broadcast in part one, um, but bring us up to speed of part two for those who, who don't know your story. Okay. Well, my family is a picture of my wife, Rhonda, my son, Evan, who was seven at the time, and my son, Alec, uh, who was 10 months old at the time, who's now soon to be 25 in about a week. <laughs> um, we're a, a loving, God-fearing family um, seeking to, to live the life that God gave us to live, live out our purpose. And um, my wife had taken my both sons, but she had taken Evan, who was seven, to um, Darby Park in Inglewood to pick up his soccer trophy and to sign him up for the intramural sports for basketball the season coming. Um, the coach wasn't there, but um, as uh, she went back to the car, she was talking to my son and she noticed that there were these guys who came, got out of a vehicle who were, um, who had approached another guy who was actually in a red vehicle. These guys were Crips, which their color's blue. Um, the guy was in a red vehicle, which is the color of the Bloods, who was their rival gang. He had nothing to do with the gang, but they approached him and asked him, I'm sure probably what set he's from or what have you. He ran, he ran beyond our vehicle. And um, one of the one who actually did the shooting, Charles Baker, he had a Mac 90 assault weapon. He had a Mac 90 assault weapon and he fired off 75 rounds. Um, three of the rounds fatally wounded Evan. Evan's life was taken from us. We became instant activists. Um, I was a part of a march 
the silent march that was speaking um, in behalf of those who had lost their lives to gun violence. Um, we got involved. My wife and I got involved in activism. We began to go into the prisons. We began to go into the youth prisons and deal with the young men and the young women about their lives and help them toward true conversion. Let them know that there's a God that loves them and that their purpose is greater than what they've probably ever known to this point. So our, our son was taken from us. Our, our, our beautiful Evan was taken from us and it totally turned our lives upside down. Um, but oh, for the grace of God, for the love of God, um, God held us up. Yeah, and um, I remember when I got the phone call, I was assistant pastor, I'm a senior pastor now, I was assistant pastor at um, a church in Inglewood. And um, I was leading prayer that evening. And I was told there was a shooting that involved your family, you need to come to Darby Park. And so I, the, probably the longest drive of my life, I went to the park, I mean, to, I went to the hospital and um, I got to the park. Then um, I had to wait there for the officer in charge. Once he arrived, um, he came over to me, was seemed like a somewhat broken guy, somewhat a little emotional actually. Um, but I learned later that he was this very tough cop, but what he had seen and what had happened to my family and Evan's life being taken, it, 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 it touched his heart, it, it broke him. And he asked me, he said, so once he got the words together, he said, so, your wife and your son are gonna be fine. And they've gone to the hospital. And I, I said, I have two sons. And he said, well, how old was your oldest son? He didn't make it. And like I said, life changed from that point forward. I was driven to the hospital by a chaplain who I had met a year before, hadn't seen him since then. And he saw me and remembered me. We were at a prayer breakfast and he broke down. He's like, oh my gosh, this is the son you were talking about at the breakfast. So. God brought our lives together and we became the best of friends. Um, but it's, it's, it was a devastating thing. It was the toughest, most egregious thing that could ever have happened to me, I believe anyone to, you know, your children should outlive you. Yeah. And let, me, to, let me ask a question, because I think for, I know you and I have talked obviously quite a bit about what had happened to the family. Uh, but I, I imagine some of the listeners are wondering, with your faith, you being a pastor, um, did you have anger toward God when, when, when this, this happened, obviously? And, and how did that obviously impact you? And how did you feel about having anger toward God if you did? And, you know, this, was, this is the honest truth. Um, and some people probably still don't believe it today but I didn't really have anger toward God. Um, God was my source. God was my all in all. Um, you know, we were living lives honoring him and worshiping him. And this happened, God allowed this to happen for a greater purpose. God didn't do it, but he allowed it for a greater purpose. He entrusted us with so great a sorrow and we deal with it. We still deal with it every day, but I wasn't angry at him. I did learn after a number of years though, that I was impacted by what happened. And God dealt with me one day and, and, and basically said in so many words as, you know, spirit to spirit, as I relate to my father and my devotional time and what have you and talk to him and, 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 and seek him for, for wisdom and guidance. I heard in my spirit that you were angry, but, you kept your cool. You were, you were angry though. And it's okay to be angry at me. It's, it's, it's okay. And as I began to look at my behavior and things maybe I did and maybe things I didn't do, um, I was like, oh Lord, I guess, I guess there was a level of, of anger that I didn't understand to be anger because my love and my allegiance to you has always just been spot on. Um, but God's like, I'm a big God. I, I can handle everything. I, I know everything. I'm all powerful. I'm ever present. I'm all knowing. So um, just give your all to me, truthfully cry out to me, surrender yourself to me, cast all your cares upon me for 
I care for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How did you, um, cause each person obviously uh, dealt or is dealing with um, the loss of Evan Steele. Uh, but how did you, how did you help Ron to get through it? Did she ever express anger towards you? Um, as far as what happened, not you, the person was like, I'm angry. I'm angry at God specifically. Did she ever express that to you um, at all? Yes. And so in so many words, yeah, there was definite anger. Um, I think when these sorts of things happen, there's anger everywhere. I mean, it's just, it just depletes your, your, your energy, um, your momentum, everything is thrown off. And Rhonda had said, she said to the Lord, well, I'm going to trust you. You're going to, you're going to have to hold me up. You're going to have to show me, but we, we all went through levels of anger and frustration um, because the most terrible thing had happened to us. Our, our, our precious son who was full of life, full of love was taken from us by an, an angry gang member who was seeking to retaliate against another gang and didn't even accomplish the task. Mm-hmm. So I, and I charged him at his sentencing not to let having killed my son be in vain, turn your life around, make a difference even behind the prison gates. And to this day, he really hasn't, he hasn't truly really lived up to it. Mm-hmm. You know what, I'm, all, I'm also, I was always wondering, um, now, now that Alex, a young man, in this experience to him happened, he was 10 months old, what sort of emotion or I'm assuming it was no anger that he felt. I'm assuming it was more of a loss or maybe a lot of why did he come to you in regards to like, dad, I don't, maybe what, I don't even know what to feel. Did he, what has he expressed to you um, along this, along this journey as well? Well, Alec was 10 months old. Yeah, you yeah. see him in his in his hospital scrubs and a, go, a goggle on his eye. He had had eye surgery. He had to have a cornea transplant because metal shrapnel had gone into his left eye. And uh, but he was still full of life, full of love because he was a baby. He didn't mm-hmm. he didn't know any better. And this should not have happened to an innocent child. Should not have happened to anyone. He was, Alec was kind of silent for a, a good bit of the time. I mean, he was, he was so much younger and we actually did a good job. I think a real res- responsible job of shielding him from all of the, the, the gun violence, the, we were doing restorative justice work, um, um, violence prevention work, gang intervention work. Um, and we shielded him until he reached a certain age. And then we um, allowed him to, to actually speak out around age 10, he actually spoke out at a, at a Women Against Gun Violence um, fundraiser. It was, it was an amazing, amazing time. Um, but he didn't have very many, and he was, we were interviewed, a family interview, maybe about three years back. And at that time, Alex spoke about the fact that he didn't really have memories of Evan. He didn't remember him, he was so, he was so young, but what memories he did gather were the ones that we gave him. Um, as we told about Evan's life and kept Evan alive so he would know his brother. Um, and he's become his own level of an activist now, um, just on his own uh, volition, on his own doing. Yeah, and I think that's important for the viewers to hear is that the stories about his big brother was told through you, which also speaks to the relationship and how you were molding and forming Evan. So that's important. Sometimes if I don't have, yeah, that picture right there speaks to it all. Um, that picture right there. So it's a, I can only imagine what you must have shared with Alec in regards to how and who his big brother was. Um, what I wanna do before we go to break, there is a letter that you had read last, uh, last, last time we were together in the very first bullet point talked about where if he, it said if he were president, number one, one is I'd want to marry a woman uh, that worked for Mary Kay, uh, like like uh, like Rhonda did. But the second bullet point spoke to to want to talk to those people who cause harm to others and tell them to go to church. So what I want to do is I, when we come back from break, I want to talk to you because you talked about that 
specific bullet point kind of catapulted you guys or pushed you guys into activism. And let's talk about that because it could have went a different way. It could have sent you into depression, um, a lot of anger toward uh, potentially to my spouse, but it took you in another direction. So we come back from break. I want to have you touch on uh, why you went the other way. Why did you all of a sudden go into activism um, to thwart uh, violence that's going on in the world? We'll be right back. Um, when we come back from break, we'll talk with Pastor Foster again. Are you ready to buy a new home or refinance a home? Call Quentin Johnson at Homestar Financial. Homestar Financial offers competitive rates for home improvement, new construction, FHA, VA, conventional, and USDA loans. Take advantage of today's low interest rates by being a smart and prepared buyer. Get pre-approved today and find out just how much house you can afford. Call Quentin Johnson at Homestar Financial. 704-526-4007. Extension 50306. Homestar Financial makes home ownership a reality. In MLS 161685. Equal housing lender. Hello and welcome back to WYTV7, Family Matters. I'm your host, Byron Pettit. Family Matters airs every Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today we're here with Pastor Rua Foster. Um, Rua Foster, before we went to break, we talked about um, there was a letter that Evan had written. And bullet point number two of that letter, you said, kind of pushed you guys into activism. Can you touch a little bit more specifically uh, what it did for you guys, how you took charge and why you took charge in the direction you guys are currently in right now? Well, the reality is we were just such a close knit family. We, we loved each other. Um, we were inseparable. Just, um, you know, I doted over, we doted over our boys um, and we raised them in the, under the admonition of the Lord. Um, so when Evan's life was taken from us, I remember the, the, the last day that, um, I saw him that morning, I was leaving for work. Um, and he came to me and he grabbed me around the waist and he said, uh, I'm going to make you so proud. Of, I'm going to make you proud of me, dad. And I said, Evan, I'm always proud of you. And he said, no, but I'm going to make you really proud of me. You know, and so I kissed him on the forehead, hugged him tight, you know, and, and, I, and I went on and that was the last time that I saw him alive. Um, he impacted so many, so many people's lives. I mean, as a young child, um, I used to think as I was assistant pastor of the church, community Bible church, um, it, actually I was assistant pastor of Miracle Life Community Church at that time, that was a different ministry. Um, I used to think that after church, because he was in, he'd be in the youth church, he'd be in service with us, and then he would make it to the youth church afterwards, because he would want to stay in the main service and hear the word that the adults were getting, opposed to being in with the youth, especially as he got to be a little bit older, he wanted to be in there. And we would think that he would be in with the youth afterwards, because we would go to the nursery after church, and we would find him in there. But we learned later from my pastor at the time that he would stop in the pastor's office and he would talk to the pastor about the messages and what, and what he got that day. And, and he would tell him, you did a good job, pastor. And, you know, <laughs> he would, you know, he would come sit on his lap. He might get a peppermint from him and, and he would, but he was such a lively person engaging, even as a child, even when they would be in the market, Rhonda would have him in the market, they're shopping and he's talking to the to the elderly person behind him in line asking them if they if they know Jesus you know it, it was just it was just really amazing and he and we led him through a prayer of salvation he gave his lord life to the lord in his once he was 3 years old he was like maybe 3 and a half i think and um, we didn't think he understood at first but as he said he wanted this we realized we realized that he that he truly did you know so his life being taken from us just the assault that was made on our family, how people around us were impacted. Our story was one of the most public stories around in a very long time. It actually made international news and was, a, was across the globe. Um, so many, many, many thousands of people were impacted by our story. And we knew that if we were going to go on and live, if we were going to go on and do everything that we believe we were supposed to do, we were we were going to do these things also in his memory and so um it be, it became um 
it empowered us. His life, the, the seven years that he had here empowered us. And we, and we went forward and we began to deal in preschools and in schools and in occupational centers and uh, churches. And every place we had an opportunity to share the love of God through opening up the atrocity that happened in our child being murdered. Um, it was a bittersweet situation, but we really believe that God called us to this type of activism, to this type of sharing of truth, to let people know that you can do the most egregious thing in this earth, take another life, but then there's still an opportunity for change and to receive the love of God and to be a part of the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think what I, 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 I was there, I was at the home going service um, for Evan. I vividly remember as I'm talking right now, that was a standing room only home going service that made international news. And, it, and you and I talked, it shook me because I had just moved to California and I was right. like, this is too much for me. Me coming from a small city uh, like Tacoma, Washington, this shook me. And I was like, I got to go back home. I'm not used to this sort of violence, but to see the strength that you had and the resolve to push forward, um, you're right. His life may have been taken at seven years of age, but God said, this is not where his life stops. Right. This is not where his story stops. Mm -mm. And uh, X amount, decades later, you guys are still marching on and still fighting the good fight. But let me also ask you, because when we did the initial interview, you talked about still having love, uh, obviously love for everyone, but not having um not having obviously hate toward the defendants, but like you said, I want them to do well in their lives. I want good for them to come as well. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about how that came to be for you. Because again, I, like I said, I probably know other people like, I don't want anything but negativity to happen to those folks that took my child's life. Why is it for you different? It's different for me because I also know that Charles Baker, the murderer of Evan, you know, he was made in God's image and likeness. He, God loved him so. Um, God knew he would come forth and God also knew what he would do. But God wants everyone to come into the knowledge of his saving grace. And so my responsibility is to love. God said, don't judge lest you be judged. And Ultimately, I felt rage because when we first went to court, he was he was condescending and arrogant and he wasn't saying a whole lot, but his body language, prison scrubs hanging down, shrugging, trying to trying to intimidate me with stares. It, it, it was just it was horrible. But when we had the opportunity to finally have the rights to give victim impact statements in court, I spent an hour and 20 minutes relating to him and the other, the other defendants and relating in this situation because we had no rights up until that time, the way the system is set up, we had no rights whatsoever. So I spoke truth and I encouraged him to get his life together, to make a difference on the inside of the prison gates, even though you're there and you may be there the rest of your life, you may not be, but make a difference and not allow having killed my son to be in vain. Make what you did, turn it around to help so many other people, to stop them from going down the same pathways. Um, you know, it was, it was a really powerful time. And God has been with us through all of this. He has truly, truly been with us. Now, you still do a lot of work going into the prisons and ministering. Uh, to young men and to uh, obviously uh, turn your life over to God, but also, you know, realizing the harm that they, how they've impacted families. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the conversations that you've had with some of the men you've met in prison, um, what they're feeling, what they're saying when they're hearing a word from you. You know, one of the things that's really amazing is um, I went to a victim's impact class at Chino Prison. And um, when I went that particular day, I, I, I think it would have been, if I remember correctly, it was like Evans around Evan's 10th birthday. 
and um, and it might have been that day if I remember correctly. But um, one of the guys who was in that class, which was a required class, which the state now has canceled, they just do a little quick and dirty thing now, opposed to really teaching them about the impact of their actions on 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 victim making victims and what have you. Um, but one of the guys who had shared the jail sh shared a jail cell with Evans' murderer was in that class, and he was so blown away to hear me speak to hear me speak with conviction and truth and to hear me speak with not hatred, but with hope for Baker's future and the future of others who have committed those kinds of crimes. And as a result of realizing the impact of what Baker had done, who had been his cellmate for an extended period at one of the prisons, he denied himself of being released early. He was gonna be released early on good behavior and things he had done. And he did not wanna be released early because he was impacted by the truth and the love that I shared that day. We also had an opportunity to, on during Victims' Rights Week one particular year, to speak to Charles Baker's son. His son got arrested as a young adult and he was sitting front row center and he heard us tell the story. He never knew who his dad had victimized. And he learned that day with his pictures and our, sto our story and the love we were showing that we were the family that his dad had, um, had hurt. And he broke down and it was, it was a powerful thing. And his mom told me later that he wants to turn his life around. He wants to help me um, once he's released. I'm not sure if he's even out yet, but I'm gonna be checking into that. He wants to make a difference and hopefully be able to give back on some level what on some level what his dad took away from us knowing he can never bring back our son but was really impacted by what had been done to our family yeah yeah, yeah i think it's it was always interesting um when individuals go into prisons and tell the story about um, how they were impacted how it can change the lives of individuals in there and as you said, it speaks to again earlier, like we said, even though life, even though Evan's life was taken at age seven, God continues to put you in situations to change other people's lives around. And that's what we're really called to do. That's what and we're you know, really called you, to do. You, you just said a key word, changing lives. We, we have received many, many awards over the years for the work that we do, but the award that we received that means the most to us is called the Changing Lives Award. Mm. And this award was given to us through the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And we were the inaugural recipients of this award. And this award was not voted on by the prison administration. It was voted on by the, the inmates. They were asked and they did surveys, who has impacted you the most over the years since you've been incarcerated? And they said the fosters have. So we received the Changing Lives Award. And, you know, we tell our story and we seek to really encourage um, the young people to change in their ways. Um, God has done amazing things as a, as a result of the work we've done. And I've been a runner. You know, I was able to even carry the Olympic torch because yeah. of the activism that my wife and I have done in the communities. Um, we took a bittersweet situation and made it a better situation. Yeah. You know what's important? Every year, you and I text one another um, of this was the day that Evan went home. For the viewers, do two things for me. Tell us Evan's date of birth and tell us when Evan went home. And there's a reason why I'm going to ask you to do that. His date of birth is September 22nd. And the day he went home is December 8th. And the reason I say that is that for us who are listening, those two dates are significant to the fosters. And we're praying a community. And even though they're going through and they're getting through and they will continue to push through, doesn't mean they're not asking for strength in prayers of strength. So if you remember those two dates, when they come along, just say, say a prayer for the foster family. And just remember who Evan Foster was, uh, not only to them, but to us. We, we've gained some insight of who the seven-year-old was and how he impacted the world before he went home to God. Root, what I want to do now is how do the viewers get a hold of you? Because I'm sure there's somebody who is going through, coming through something or will go through something 
that your story will be able to help them. So how can they get in contact with you? Well, I'll give you my cell. My, my cell is 323-806-7038. And if I'm texted, it's better. But if you leave a message, I'll eventually get to it as well. My email address is ruett.foster at gmail.com. And I also have a Facebook page where you, you can message me through Facebook. Um, perhaps at another time, I'll tell you about other ventures and things we're doing. I know that we're close to being out of time, but um, it's, it's been a privilege. And I just really want to thank you, Byron, for the opportunity. You've, you've been a, a brother that we've expressed love and support for one another. This is a picture of Byron and, yeah, and well, Alec <laughs> after Evan's <laughs> passing. Yeah. And um, he was there from the very beginning and continues to be there, you know, some 24 years later. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Rua Foster. I appreciate you as a big brother. I appreciate the work that you not only doing in L.A. County, throughout the world. Um, this will be seen by people throughout the world. So I hope people, again, reach out to you um, for encouragement. Um, and insight how to make it through. If you'd like to be on Family Matters, you can reach out to me at 704-288-4612, or I can be reached on the website, www.practicalfamilyresolutions.com, or you can email me at practicalfamilyresolutions at gmail.com. Thank you again, Ruth, and the best You're of so luck. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. My Take privilege. Care. God bless.